thanks for the introduction and thanks to the organizing committee for inviting me to to give this uh, lecture at the robotics and AI summer school um i i when i proposed the title of the lecture i think i was uh, a bit too enthusiastic uh the original title was unsupervised learning for human robot interaction and then i added this towards unsupervised learning for human robot interaction because some of the things that i'm going to present today are not exactly unsupervised although we would like to go towards this so first of all i'd like to introduce uh the team that i'm working with uh they are the ones that should receive most of the credit uh of uh, what i will be discussing today uh we are a bunch of people from engineers to phd students to postdocs and it's thanks to uh, all of them that i'm i'll be able to present the what i believe is uh, really interesting uh, topics of today so just to give a bit of a um, context to what I'm going to present, uh, I'll ask you to imagine a robot, uh, a social robot in uh, each of the environments that, that you can see in these pictures. And the, the robot here should be able to discuss with people, identify the person that is in need of something or deliver a message to that person, you know, all these kind of uh, of uh, social and uh, useful tasks. And uh, so motivated by this, our ambition is to train robots so that they acquire the capacity to learn, to listen, to learn, so to keep on learning, to move and speak in a socially acceptable manner within this environment. So we are, uh, we are mainly funded by three uh, different sources. Um, the first one is an H2020 project that is called SPRING, which stands for Socially Pertinent Robots in Gynecological Healthcare. A second one is the Multidisciplinary Institute of Artificial Intelligence here in Grenoble, in Grenoble. And within that, uh, I'm co-chairing the audiovisual machine perception and interaction for companion robot topic. And finally, um, uh, a project within the Young Research Call of the of the French National Funding Agency, which is called NERI, and within which we organize these deep tail seminars. Uh, so I really encourage you to go and take a look to these uh, three different uh, web pages so that you can learn a little bit more of, of this context. And just to summarize this, basically we are interested in multi-person scenarios, how to perceive these scenarios, and how to naturally interact uh, within these scenarios. So the way I'm going to uh, structure this talk is that I'll I'll present a contribution. Uh, so in this in the case you can see here in the slides, it's a paper that was published at CVPR last year. Uh, and then uh, after that, uh, you know, we will do one after another. So I don't know if you have question, a very urgent question. Maybe you can uh, interrupt while we are discussing a certain topic or if you prefer to keep it until the end that's that's also okay but the first contribution is about training a deep multi-object tracker and this is mainly the work of Yi Hong and Aliosha with uh, contributions from Yutong, Radu, Laura and myself um, for those who don't know what multiple object tracker is doing it's basically tracking multiple objects um, so you can see here in the, this is a typical example. This is a camera that is looking at a street and you have many people walking uh, in the street and you can see that each person has a, uh, a bonding box with a certain color and there is some kind of a trace in the form of, of small squares. And this is where the position of the bonding box, I mean, the bottom of the bonding box was placed in the previous frames, all right? And of course, an ideal tracker should detect a person whenever this person gets in the field of view and follow this person all along uh, his or her path when the person is, of course, uh, within the field of view. So that's our task. And uh, previously, and, and still some, some trackers uh, are, are trained with the L2 loss. Basically, you have a, uh, an MSC between the ground truth bounding box and the detected bounding box. 
But the problem is that you have to know which uh, detected bounding box, so the output of the tracker, corresponds to which ground truth bounding box. And to do that, at every frame, there is a slightly modified version of the Hangaran algorithm that is performing this assignment in an optimal manner, so that there, so that after that, you can correct uh, the detected bounding box to be as close as possible to the associated ground truth bounding box. So this is what is a training time, and then a test time. Again, you need, of course, to uh, run this Hungarian algorithm at, at every frame, and then you can compute the uh, the multiple object tracking metrics for evaluation that we will briefly discuss in a few slides. So what we are proposing is to approximate the Hungarian algorithm with a deep Hungarian network that is approximating the optimal assignment with a soft assignment that is actually differentiable, so that then you can back propagate from the metrics directly to the tracker without needing to uh, pass through this non-differentiable step, which is the Hungarian algorithm. So in a way, we are back propagating through the assignment, and hopefully we will be able to teach the tracker to be even better so that the assignment network does a good job. So just to give a bit more details on, on how, how things were done in practice, as I said, you have a detected uh, bounding boxes or tracking results on the left. Each of them will be a row of a dist uh, this distance matrix that you have, dt. And each row contains the distance between the, the detected object and the ground truth object. So basically in this example here, uh, what you can see is in the, the first row will correspond to the first column because it's the smallest distance, the second row to the second column, and then the last row probably does not correspond to any of the ground truth objects because all the distances are quite high. Okay? So the Hungarian algorithm then, of course, is assigning this uh, uh, optimally, a priori, so it's somehow outputting an assignment matrix that is filled with one and or n zeros. And one means that the corresponding detected object is uh, assigned to the ground truth object. And of course, this is an algorithm, so there is no analytical form. There is no formula here, and it is not differential. And this is uh, a bit problematic. So this is what, uh, with this assignment at training time, we can compute the, uh, we can compute the loss, right? The MSC between the detected objects and the ground truth objects. Then at test time, what we need to do is to compute the metrics. So there are two main metrics in multiple object tracking, which is the MOTA for accuracy and P for precision. Basically, there are three kinds of errors in multiple object tracking. Now I am in the first line in MOTA. You can have either false positives, uh, bounding bugs that are detected but shouldn't be there, false negatives, which is the other way around, and then identity switches. And this happens when typically two people cross and then the identity of the bounding box is switches. All right, so this is also counted as, uh, as an error. So basically, MOTA is 100% or one minus all the errors that you do. And of course, the higher the better. And then MOT, MOTP is a bit different, is um, for the correctly detected objects, uh, how much is their distance with respect to the ground truth, all right? So between these two, uh, the MOTA is the uh, most important one in the community, at least. And of course, computing MOTA and MOTP is non-differentiable either. So what we are going to propose is not only a way to approximate the Hungarian algorithm, but also to approximate these two metrics so that the whole pipeline is different. Yes, so this is what I just said. Um, in order to approximate the Hungarian algorithm, we propose the Deep Hungarian Network, or DHN, and we must, in order to design the DHN, we have to take into account two important properties of the Hungarian algorithm. First of all, that it works for whatever number of rows and columns. So basically, we need a network that is able to process matrices with different number of rows and columns. 
And also the Hengen algorithm is a global optimization procedure. So in terms of network, what this means is that each of the output neurons must have a global receptive field. So each of the output neurons has to be processed, taking into account all the input information. So in here, you can see the design that we have chosen. Uh, you have on the top the distance matrix D in uh, blue or kind of yeah, purple blue. And then on the bottom left, you have the output assignment matrix or the soft assignment matrix A tilde in red. Okay. So the two conditions above means that N and M can be different for uh, different uh, points in time and will be different. And the second one means that the receptive field of each of the red squares that you can see of the matrix A must be the entire matrix D. So what do we do to accommodate these two conditions is to first uh, row-wise flatten the matrix, then have a bidirectional RNN, reshape it back to the original uh, layout. Now, column-wise flatten, all right? Again, a bidirectional RNN, reshape it back to the original layout. And then we have a set of fully connected layers that operate per each pixel independently. And these are the ones that provide the final result. Okay. And this uh, design is not the only one that satisfies the two conditions above, but is among the ones that we have tried, is the one that performs best. Now, this is for the Hungarian algorithm, but we also need to approximate the multiple object tracking accuracy and precision. So to do that, we will, uh, you remember that MOTA was consisted of uh, false positive, false negatives, and identity switches. So this is the first thing we have to approximate. Um, so the input is always the distance matrix that goes through this deep Hungarian network and provides a soft assignment matrix. In order to compute the false positive, we will add this column with a certain fixed value delta. You can think of this as some sort of a threshold because then we, we run this row-wise softmax. So you can see, for instance, in the first two rows, we have two numbers that are quite high, 0, 09 and 0, 08. So when I apply softmax, this will give me these two rectangle, these two squares that are in green which is an almost certain assignment. And then the third row, uh, it has very low values. So when I add the delta and I run the row by softmax, actually is this uh, square in yellow that has the highest probability, all right? And this is because the, the third object, this third row was very far away. Uh, I'm sorry, this, is, this must be one, this is the assignment, it's a assignment probability. So. Yes, it, the the, assign, the probability to assign the third row to one of the columns, one of the grand truth objects was very low. So when I, whenever I take the soft max, actually I end up with uh, something that is telling me you should actually, I mean, most likely uh, this is a false positive because it, it has very low probability to be assigned to any of the grand truth objects. So basically the sum over the yellow column is going to give me an, the expected number of false positives. And this is an interpretation, it's not a formalization. We don't train the network to give the expected numbers, it's the way we interpret. And the same goes for the false negatives, but now I have to add a row with the very same delta, apply column Y softmax, and then I have an estimate of the expected numbers of expected number of false negatives. And once more, this is the way we interpret this result. In order to compute the identity switches, I will just consider uh, the upper part of, of the matrix uh, that is the result of the column-wise softmax, and then compare it to the assignments that I had in the previous time step. So I need the assignments of the previous time step, right? And then I will basically sum um, over the blue squares and this will give me the uh, expected number of identity switches, okay? Um, and once more, once again, this is an interpretation. We don't train the network to do that. So now we, uh, we have everything we need for the multiple object tracking accuracy because we need the false positive, false negatives, and identity switches. And then we finally need to approximate the MOTP, 
But this is very easy. We actually take up the assignments that are provided by the row-wise row softmax here on the top. We have an element-wise multiplication with the distance matrix. And this gives me the distance of the assigned sources. And this is basically the approximation of the MOTP. So now we are very happy because we have our deep multi-object multi -object tracker, which is going to have whatever architecture. Then the deep Hungarian network that approximates the Hungarian algorithm in a differentiable manner. And then the mod loss, which is the approximation of the MOTA and MOTP that I just discussed. Of course, at evaluation time, we use the MOT metrics, the original ones, and not the losses that we just proposed. So at the time, the state of the art on the mod 17 and mod 16 was tractor. So we uh, put the, this uh, training strategy on top of tractor and we basically verified that it improved the, the performance by basically reducing the number of false positives, sometimes the false negatives as well, and uh, the identity switches. So in terms of MOTA and MOTP, this was uh, quite an interesting uh, finding. And the advantage is that you should be able to put this on top of any deep multi-object trial. Now, one detail that is uh, interesting is, um, I didn't talk much about that, is how to compute this, this distance, right? I, I mentioned the distance matrix uh, many times, but how do I compute the, the, each entry of this matrix? And why is this important? Is because if you, if you take the example on the top, and you have the bounding box one and two. Um, these are two estimates, right? Two uh, tracked objects. And then you have the ground truth, which is the green bounding box. If you use the intersection over union, which is very common uh, in, um, in multiple object tracking, this IOU is zero for both bounding boxes. Uh, this has two problems. First, that I don't know if the green is closer to the one or to, to the bounding box one or bounding box two, which is a pity because it's clearly closer to bounding box one. But anyway, even if I only had bounding box one, the problem is now the, the IOU is zero uh, in a neighborhood around the bounding box. So if I move the bounding box a little bit or I shrink it a bit or I make it larger a bit, the IOU is going to be zero which means that the gradient is going to be zero. Basically, I cannot train now because the gradient is zero and then I don't, I don't know where do I have to push my bounding box number one to, right? Uh, so we basically enriched the IOU uh, with some sort of uh, L2 based uh, distance, which is this Y minus exponential that you can see here. And then the advantage is that you can you can see down here in the slide, in the graph, sorry. Uh, you see the IOU like grows, well, this is one minus one IOU. It grows until basically the bounding box is zero intersection, and then it's flat. And the problem is that in this flat region, the gradient is zero, so I cannot do any trade. So we, what we propose is a purple one, which has, it's a combination between the IOU and the alto norm. And therefore, my, my distance is always increasing whenever I get farther and farther. <clears throat> Sorry. And then in order to um, complement that, we also took into account a visual descriptor. And this is very useful when two bounding boxes, when two people are crossing, because then whenever I they, they, they cross, I mean, whenever one of them gets back in the field of view again, only using uh, geometry or the position of the bounding boxes is not enough. So if I have a way to describe the contents of the bounding boxes, then I can be a bit more discriminative. And this is what we used. Uh, we used a pre-trained, uh, uh, first a pre-trained network, then an external network, and then we also used another head so this is what you see on the slide. And we call this the re-identification branch or head. It's basically responsible 
to uh, recognize tracks that have already been seen and this some sort of reactivate them. So this is uh, very interesting for um, for characterizing the content of the bounding box on top of uh, the geometry or the position, which is what we did with the previous uh, loss. Um, so this is all for the multiple object tracking. Then we keep on thinking about this uh, re-identification um, uh, issue because uh, we realize that it is um, re-identification networks are really depending on the data set. Uh, and this is, uh, of course, undesirable because uh, you, you don't know in advance who do you want to track, right? In, in the scenarios that we have just discussed, like a robot or in the street, you don't know in advance what you want to track. So we wanted to be able to adapt to new appearances in an unsupervised uh, manner. So this is the work of Guillaume and Yihong together with, with Stefan, Radu and myself. And that was presented at uh, ICPR, well, 2020, but the conference was at the beginning of, of 2021. So, in the standard uh, ray identification task, uh, what we have is a very large annotated data set uh, in which each of the you know, small images is supposed to contain a person. And we have, we have annotated uh, you know, the index of the person, right? We call it here ID, it's the identity index from one to the number of persons that are in the data set. And of course we know from uh, which camera this uh, this was taken. Typically, ReID data sets are taken from several cameras. So this is my training set. And then when we are testing in a, a person identification, we have a set of queries, and then we have a gallery. And we compare the query with the gallery, and this is how we decide uh, which identity does the query correspond to. Right. And then, of course, we have all the standard measures for retrieval. Um, the interesting thing is that neither the query set nor the gallery have been seen during training. Right? This is very important. Uh, and this, uh, as I said before, requires the annotation of the identity at training time. And this is a problem because sometimes you don't know uh, who you want to be training. So you will have access uh, to a new data set of people going back and forth, but you don't know the identities of these people. So in this, in this sense, we have this unsupervised person re-identification, which is the, this red uh, circle, for which we don't have the identities of the training set. And what we are going to be presenting is an unsupervised domain adaptation technique that would exploit the images and the labels of the source training set that you have in blue and the images, but not the labels, because we don't have them, of the target training set that you have in red in the bottom of the, of the diagram. So there are of course, some works that are uh, addressing this issue, uh, they are based on what is called the clustering and fine tuning framework, um, in which you, uh, uh, you basically pre-train uh, your backbone, your feature extractor uh, in, the, in the source set. So this is standard ready, that's all right. And then, it goes into an alternating procedure between um, extracting the features for all the target set and clustering these features extracted. And this provides cell labels that actually correspond to the centroid of my clustering. And then I use these cell labels to fine tune the backbone as if they were the identity labels in, um, in person reality. Okay, so this is why we call them pseudo identity labels because it's not ground truth. It's what's extracted um, from 
you know, after extracting features and running the clustering on the unannotated target data set. So we also inspired from something called uh, adversarial domain adaptation. Uh, this is uh, this is a framework that is convenient for us because you have a feature extractor and then this goes to two different uh, branches. So the bottom one is the easiest one. It would be uh, the identity classifier. So that would be supervised person ID. And of course you can also run it on the source data set. So this is why you have an LS here. Then off top of that, you can have a discriminator that is trying to identify if these features that you have extracted correspond to images from the target set or from the source training set, okay? So this is an adversarial domain discriminator. And then you can now interpret this feature extractor as a feature generator that is trying to generate features that are domain invariant. So that the discriminator here in blue has a very tough time to identify which is the, uh, the domain the features are extracted from. The problem here is that the identities and the domains are not completely independent. Actually, they are not at all. Like if you take two data sets uh, that are recorded in different conditions, the identities on of one data set are not in the other one. So basically by knowing the ID, you can immediately know the domain. So in other words, if you remove all the domain information from these features, you are actually harming the uh, ID classifier. And this is what we uh, refer to as negative transfer in this particular uh, setting. So what we proposed okay, uh, are two things. First is instead of a domain discriminator, we have a camera discriminator because the cameras are, I mean, you know which camera was used to extract the image. So this is a basically a free label. And now this uh, discriminator is a bit, it has a tougher uh, task, which is identifying the camera, but it also makes things more difficult for the feature extract. And then in order to overcome the negative transfer effect, what we did is condition this discriminator with the centroid uh, that the input image corresponds to. And in somehow we are conditioning with the identity or the pseudo identity label uh, so that we can avoid uh, the negative structure. So of course this, this, uh, this can be plugged in any uh, clustering and functioning strategy. So we call this conditional adversarial network for unsupervised uh, re-identification. So basically, can you re-ID? And then when we plug it on top of MMT or SSG, we call it can you MMT and can you SSG? Um, and uh, what to evaluate this, we basically used a bunch of uh, data sets. Uh, we tried transfer from market to Duke and vice versa, and transfer from market or Duke to the MSMT data set, which is quite challenging. And what we report are standard read metrics, which is a wrong one and the mean average precision. Basically what we demonstrated is that uh, systematically we can increase the performance of these two methods, the SSG and the MMT, which were state of the art at the time, using uh, the CANU framework on top of them. And this would happen for all the transfer settings that we have uh, evaluated. So market to Duke and vice versa, and then market or Duke towards MSMT. So this is one thing that is unsupervised uh, and that therefore we would be able hopefully to use this with our robotic platforms quite soon. So that goes for, uh, for the re-ID. Uh, and the, the next two words that I'm going to present are more focused on the multi-person interaction. The first one is about uh, monocular 3D pose estimation and more, more precisely on how to use the pose of the people that are surrounding the person of interest to enhance the inference of, of that pose. 
And this is a joint work with uh, one, which is a PhD student, that is co-supervised uh, with uh, Francesc and also Enrique, which is a PhD student of Francesc, collaborated uh, in this work. This was presented at WACB again um, earlier this year. So as I said, the task here is uh, in multi-person scenarios when people are clearly interacting. Uh, you have the three. You have three D pose structures from monocular images, and now the question is: Can I exploit, for instance, the position of all these colorful skeletons to improve the pose of that I estimated of uh, the black skeleton? And uh, so, the intuition is actually uh, very easy uh, because. We can clearly understand that if there are three people talking, uh, I can use or I should be able to use to exploit the pose of the purple and the green persons to in, uh, enhance the inference of, of the red person. Uh, to do that, we propose, we propose a pose interaction network or PyNet, which operates after any uh, deep uh, single person 3D monocular pose estimator. Uh, so basically, you can think of this as a person detection plus a pose estimator, so mask RCMM and PoseNet. And this provides P1, P2, P3, which are the poses of the three persons. Another question is how do I merge the information there so that, uh, that I can enhance the, the position, sorry, the pose estimation for the three persons, or at least for one of them? So we use here the bidirectional RNN plus some self-attention and some uh, MLPs. And this is basically refining uh, the pose of each of the persons. At least this is how we train the network. But then at test time, we only use the, the blue part. So basically, one, we, we will first process this for P1 to obtain Q1, and then process this for P2 to obtain Q2 and so forth and so on. And this works a little bit better than if we try to do the three at the same time. So we train that with the uh, MUCO composited data, uh, which is uh, basically a synthetic data set of people and therefore are not interacting, but at least there are multiple people uh, in the scene. And then the MUPOTS uh, 3D data set, which is quite small. So we couldn't use this for, we couldn't use this for training. And these are clearly people that are doing uh, actions together. So this is the kind of scenario in which we want to, uh, to test. And we can see that uh, if we compare uh, our output, which is in green, to the state of the art, and knowing the grand truth, which is in black, uh, so basically the green skeleton, which is a refined one, is closer to the black one than the red. And this is a behavior that we were able to uh, verify, let's say, quantitatively uh, by computing the standard metrics on different sequences of the MUPOTS data set. And we can see that for almost all of them, and in average, we had performed the state of the art at the time. Uh, but because this data uh, was not enough, uh, we decided to record a data set, which we called extreme pose interaction data set. And this is um, a couple of uh, dancers that are performing dancing uh, actions that are aerials or uh, acrobasis, acrobatics, and for which we clearly uh, need an interaction here, a physical interaction to perform the action. Uh, so this will be uh, available soon uh, for uh, the research community, and we hope that we will. This will allow, allows us to better understand how to exploit interactions between uh, people that are doing actions together. The second interaction uh, work I wanted to discuss is called social interaction GAN, uh, which, and we are here interested together with uh, Louis and Dominique, which are two colleagues. Um, here at, at, at INRIA in how to generate sequences of actions of people that are interacting uh, 
uh, one, you know, in groups of two or three persons. So just let me be very clear on what, uh, what we are generating to avoid confusion. So you can see here, this is a typical example of, uh, of a, a situation in which people are having social gatherings and they are talking to each other. And then we have this uh, annotated by action. So you can see here drinking or, you know, speaking or hand gesture or, okay. So these are action classes. And what we are interested is to be able to generate sequences of these action classes. So we are not going to be generating video. We are, what we want to generate in the first place is uh, sequences of tokens and each token represents one action. Okay, and you have three people interacting. So you have to generate a sequence of, uh, you know, three sequences in parallel and that they make sense all together because they are supposed to represent ac the actions that people take when they are interacting. So for this, we use the, the match and mingle data set. Uh, I, I suggest if you're interested in this kind of things, it's a very nice data set, so you can go and check it. And so this is a problem, right? We have a, an observed sequence. You know, at the beginning, the person in orange is speaking, so I write down speaking. Uh, then at the end, uh, you know, it made the person in red laugh. So at the end of telling the joke, uh, the red, the orange person is still speaking, and the, the red person started laughing. So this is the a, a sequence that is observed is fed to the social interaction gun, and then the social interaction gun is supposed to generate what happens from now on. So I don't know, the blue person didn't find this funny, so it drinks a little bit, then it goes again, and then it's the red one that tells a joke and the blue one that laughs, or just because he or she understood the joke of the orange person, but a little bit late, all right? So from this observed sequence of actions of the three persons, then the social interaction gun has to generate the sequence of future actions that these persons will take. So this is how it looks like. Um, we have this up to n people. Well, we can think about three. That's all right. We, basically, the method is general. Uh, the observed action sequences are, are fed into LSTMs that share weights. So this is what we call the encoder. Then some noise is added. And then we have this decoder here that is supposed to generate uh, the future which you can see here in kind of dashed squares, right? So how do we take into account the interaction? You can see that the orange, red, and blue arrows go to this polling, polling module, sorry, in the decoder that is merging the information of the three or n people that are involved in the interaction and feeding this to the LSTM um, at every time step, right? So in this way, so this is the mechanism that allows us to synchronize. And for instance, that when someone stops speaking, uh, then someone else starts speaking. Okay? So this is the mechanism that allows us to model this. So that, that's our generator. And then the discriminator, you can see it on the right. Of course, we input the real sequences and the generated sequences, which consist of the observed part in solid color and the uh, generated part in a dashed color. Then, of course, the discriminator needs to compare the generated sequences and the real sequences. And identify, I mean, and of course, the discriminator is trying to do its best at recognizing which of the sequences are generated and which of them are real. In our case, our discriminator has the dual stream. So we call this a dual stream discriminator because we want to be sure that each sequence is realistic on its own, like per se, individually, but also that the three or more sequences make sense together. So we have an individual stream on the top and the interaction stream on the bottom that uses a very similar pooling module as the decoder because it's the very same principle. We need to put this the information of the different people together to decide whether or not the interactions, so the dynamics between the people are realistic or are fake. Our discriminator has a bit of an implementation trick that I would like to discuss. Um, so the naive implementation would be to give all the sequence to an LSTM uh, and to 
discriminate either with the last hidden state, which we call this the simple RNN, or with uh, you know all the hidden states, which we call this the dense RNN in the experiments. But we can also break down the sequence into windows and then give each of them to an LSTM that produces a representation and then judge the realism of all these representations. So this is, of course, is a bit more time consuming, but the advantage is that you ensure that the generated sequence is realistic at different times and at different resolutions. So it, it's much more richer in terms of supervision than the dense or the simple uh, strategies. So when we wanted to evaluate this, we faced the problem that uh, standard uh, ES and FID scores are not directly applicable. Uh, in particular for the FID, we needed a way to extract features from a sequence. So we couldn't use, you know, VGZ trained on ImageNet because it doesn't know anything about sequences of actions. So what we did is we trained a network on an auxiliary task using the same data set and trying to estimate the proportion of each action within the sequence. So this was trivial to annotate and it was neutral regarding our task. And so this is going to be the network that we use to extract features from the generated sequence so as to compute the FID. And we call this the sequence freshet inception distance. So <clears throat> some of the findings, as I said before, is that the local RNN strategy is actually working much better than the other two, which are the simple and the dense. This is whether you use supervision or not, or it's fully adversarial during training and independently of the measure that you use to evaluate, like the marginal entropy or the conditional entropy or the SFI. We also uh, try to generate sequences of different lengths um, and using or, or, you know, using supervision or without supervision. And uh, you can see that it doesn't matter uh, in which condition the green uh, line, which corresponds to this local RNN that breaks the generated sequences and subsequences of different windows, different resolutions, and has much more uh, discriminative power than the simple or dense uh, RNNs. So basically, this is a very nice strategy, at least for training, for training the, the network that, uh, <coughs> that we wanted to train. It's something to keep in mind if you are working with sequential data and an adversarial setting, of course. All right, so this is um, done for the interaction. And now I want to, would like to discuss a different topic, which is uh, speech enhancement. And in particular, audiovisual speech enhancement. This is joint work with uh, Mustafa, which is a researcher at INRIA, but in uh, Nancy. Laurent, a professor uh, here in Grenoble, Radu and myself. And this was presented because there are different models, as you will see, at uh, transactions and all the speech and language processing, and then ICAST last year and and this year was presented just a couple of weeks ago. So the task of speech enhancement is to extract the clean speech signal from a noisy mixture. All right, so you have a person, the speaker of interest, and then the window is open, and there is a car in the background. So of course, you want to remove the car sound to extract what the people is saying, what the person is saying. And in particular, we suppose here that we have access to a video that corresponds to the audio, of course. Uh, uh, you know, it can be the video of a face, but somehow we have access to the lip region. And we are going to exploit the leaf movements, to learn to exploit the leaf movements, to better enhance the speed signal. So in the literature, you can find supervised um, methods that basically input the video together with the noisy speech, and they directly output the enhanced speech. Now, one limitation with these methods, they are powerful, but they depend on um, on the noise types that have been seen during training. So now, if you now you want to try and train a different noise type, sometimes it's 
difficult to obtain uh, the same performance that that the one that you could obtain for the noise types that have been single in training. So instead of that, because in our robotics general context, we not necessarily know what kind of noises we will be facing, we opt for an unsupervised the visual speech enhancement strategy that would be trained with only clean audiovisual data and then the noise will come at test time of course and we will have to estimate the noise parameters at test time so it is a little bit more computationally expensive but we have the advantage to be adaptive to different kind of noise so <clears throat> to model the clean signal we tried we base that on variational autoencoders. So the first thing to try, of course, is an audio-only variational autoencoder. So you give the spectrogram to the encoder, and then it tries to reconstruct the very same uh, the very same spectrum vector. We also tried this with a video-only VAE. So basically, we give the image of the leads, and we try to reconstruct the audio spectrogram. And then the first thing we have proposed was to concatenate these two pieces of information. So you concatenate audio to video in the encoder, in the decoder, and in the prior, actually. And you try to do the best to reconstruct the uh, audio signal from the audio and visual signals. So if you do this, if you treat this as a regular VAE, the problem is that the network learns to ignore the video. Why? Because in the audio, you have all the information to reconstruct the very same audio vector. So if you train this, uh, like say brute force, you will end up obtaining actually the very same audio only VA because the network will learn to you know, ignore the video. So we had to force a little bit the network to pay attention to the video. And this is what you have in the equation below. Don't, don't be afraid. So the first term, uh, it has an expectation and the, and the KL divergence is the standard loss of VAEs. So if you know what it is, that's all right. And if you don't know, don't worry. Um, and then you have this extra term in orange, which is very similar to the expectation that you have here on the left. And this is a reconstruction loss, but it is sampling from the prior of the visual data. So this means that we are forcing the network to reconstruct partly from visual data and therefore to pay attention to the visual data when reconstructing the audio scene. So this is how we get the network to pay attention to video. So that's quite all right. The problem is that audio and video are systematically concatenated and therefore we are forced to use both audio and video all the time. Now it comes a problem because if at some point you have a very strong noise I don't know, the, the car that uh, crashes with another car in front of uh, my window. And then at this precise moment, it's useless to use audio because it's completely corrupt. The similarly, if uh, the speaker that I have uh, that I am watching with the camera, it kind of, you know, uh, scratches the mouth or has the microphone in front of the mouth, then I cannot use video. So we wanted to develop a mechanism that in an unsupervised way, it could select how much attention or how much is using vision or audio, you know, it, it, that it could select either one of the two or the best combination of the two. So what we did, we decided to use a mixture of uh, relational encoders. So the prior of the latent variable is a mixture of two priors. This is why you have here a prior in green for the audio and a prior in blue for the video. And then you have one single decoder. Okay, so this is the one in black on the top. Okay. And then this is this is not supervised. So this alpha n will need to be inferred uh, at training time and at test time. So to do this, we have to propose a variational expectation maximization algorithm that I am not going to detail now. If you're interested, you can send me an email or we can you can take a look to the paper. It's a bit tedious to explain this with uh, with slides. But another consequence is that when you put this uh, mixture in the prior, your posterior is also a mixture of um, of two encoders. 
And it is very nice because here we can at least initialize these parameters with the encoders of the audio only and visual only BAEs. So this is what we do, we initialize like this, and then we train the decoder and we fine tune the encoders. And at the same time, we infer the variables, the variable alpha n for every frame uh, that is in the training set. And we will have to do this in the test set as well. At the same time, we estimate the, the noise parameters. Okay, so this is just a summary. So we have the audio only VAE, the visual only VAE, then the audio visual that was using a systematic concatenation of audio and video. And then the mixture of inference networks VAE, the mean VAE, which was actually for every frame selecting which was the best thing to do, audio only, visual only, or a combination of the two. So at test time, so this all this is a training time, and then at test time we combine this with a negative matrix factorization model for the noise. And then we derive yet another VA, VEM, so variational expectation maximization algorithm, to jointly estimate the clean speed signal, uh, sorry, to, to jointly infer the clean speed signal from the noisy observations. At the same time, we estimate the noise parameters W and H. So this is the part that requires some, con I mean, very strong mathematical um, uh, derivations, and therefore I decided not to put it in the slide. But we can see here some results. Um, these are uh, three different metrics, uh, SDR, PESC, and STOI, and what we report here is the improvement. Um, so the, uh, as a function of the SNR. So on the left part of the um, graphs, you have uh, sound signals that are highly corrupted by noise. And on the right part, you have noise signals that are highly clean. And in the middle, you have like some kind of an average. And this is why you have some sort of bell-shaped curves that are everywhere, because we are measuring the improvement. And when the input signal is very bad, it's difficult to improve because you have very few information to improve over that signal. And it is the same, well, it, a similar effect is experienced when the signal is very good, so at the right part of the graphs, because it's already so good that it's very difficult to improve a lot. So this is why we have this bell shape and the best improvements, we have them in the middle around zero dBs, because we have enough information to actually run an improvement and it, uh, the input signal is not so good, so we can actually, we have a lot of room for input. Um, another uh, observation here is that the mean VAE, which is the dark green, was outperforming, let's say globally, was outperforming all the other models. And this is the, the mixture strategy that we have proposed. So we thought that this was a very, very, very good idea. You have web pages here that you can check for a, uh, for samples, so you can hear how much do we enhance. Now the problem is that all these operate for each time frame independently. Uh, so this means that we could actually shuffle the signal uh, on time over time, and then we'll obtain the same result, which is quite crazy because the speed signal doesn't work that way at all. So what we decided is to extend the mixture of inferred networks with a temporal model for the latent variable. So uh, yeah, for, for the variable that is switching between the two, uh, between the visual and the audio encoders. So that is kind of a hidden Markov model with a VAE emission probability. Uh, or you can see this as a, a VAE with a prior that is switching over time. So we decided to call this a switching variation of the um, and we can provide results and we basically see that we outperform our previous uh, mean VA. Um, so basically that this means that the, the switching variation of the encoder can partially model the, dynamic, the dynamics of the latent code, right? But it is not, I have to say that this is a partial modeling. And then we were wondering if we could actually model this a little bit better. And uh, we basically went to the literature and performed a huge review on this kind of models uh, that you can find for now in archive. Uh, we have also presented different summaries of these at ICAS last year and at Interspeeds this year. 
and we refer to this umbrella of models as dynamical variational autoencoders, and I will try to briefly discuss them without going into much detail. So just to give a bit of a context, uh, if you think about probabilistic models, you have some of them that are frame-based, for instance, GMMs or probabilistic PCA, or sequence-based, like the Kalman filter, right? Linear dynamical filters. Then you also have deterministic deep networks like convolutional networks or DNNs that operate frame-wise and recurrent networks that operate through time, like for sequential data. And then you have deep probabilistic models uh, for instance, the VAE is one of these probabilistic models that operates frame-based, but then the question is, what kind of deep probabilistic models operate sequence-based and what are them, like deep state space models, probabilistic RNNs or sequential VAEs, and actually is the three of them at the same time. And this is what we refer to as dynamic operational encoders. And you can see a very simple example here. This is called recurrent variational autoencoder is very similar to standard VAE, but it's just that the latent code, so in the VAE, the latent code Z is used to generate X, end of the story. Now, on top of that, the latent code will actually accumulate through time with a recurrent neural network. So this idea is very simple to understand. And in terms of probabilistic dependencies, what is the consequence of it? Is that now my ZT minus one is not impacting only the x to minus one but also all future x's because once it is generated it is accumulated into ht and then it will have an impact on all the future xt all right so in terms of probabilistic modeling this changes a lot the dependencies and now most interestingly when you consider the inference network which should be the posterior distribution of zt condition of the sequence of Z's condition to the sequences of X's, you now need all the future X's to actually perform inference on the current ZT. Okay, so ZT will depend on ZT minus one and all the previous ZT's, but it will depend on the current X, which is normal, this happens for the VAEs, but also on all the future X's. So this very simple model has, I mean, this very simple change compared to VAEs has a kind of very strong impact on the way you formulate. So there are a few models. I will pass a little bit uh, quickly through that. Uh, this is just to show that in the original papers, so, so these subtle differences are so difficult to graph sometimes that in the original papers, they forgot some of the dependencies in the inference model that you can see here in the yellow arrow. So we try to put all this together to present all this in a very consistent way in our review paper that you can download in archive. The code of all these models is there, uh, pre-trained on different speed data sets. So you can actually play around with this and we will be very happy to have uh, your feedback if uh, you are interested. We also gave a tutorial at ICASP about this and you can also find the videos in this, uh, in this uh, webpage, dynamicalvae.github.io. So as a conclusion, our, after all that I have uh, discussed, um, is that when you have multi-person interactive scenarios, there are many challenges, many open challenges there. Uh, and I hope to be addressing some of them uh, in, in the future still. So for instance, localize, detect and track people in an unsupervised manner, re-ID this person, uh, how to model the effects of, uh, of interactions. Uh, of course, as, as you have seen, fusing of the visual, audio and visual data is uh, quite beneficial sometimes. Um, adapting to a new domain without any annotations because the robot, when it enters a new room, you, cannot, you don't have the luxury to annotate data. Um, processing all these uh, in a sequential manner with perhaps DVAEs or any other methods. And then finally, when you decide that something has to run on your robot, uh, then you have to weigh, uh, you have to find a way to implement this in a computationally very efficient manner, perhaps using some of the tricks that Adria has discussed in the previous uh, talk. So thanks for your attention, and I'll be happy to um, to take your questions if you have any. Thank you very much, Javier.